In this video, we'll be looking at human reproduction, which is found in paper one, and it consists of around 31 marks. We'll look at the schematic outline of the human life cycle, specifically with meiosis, mitosis, and then fertilization, and thereafter we'll move on to the male and the female reproductive systems. As a quick recap, in case you forgot what diploid and haploid means, so diploid means uh, or is represented by 2n and it means that there are two copies of each chromosome so one from the mother and one from the father or maternal and paternal and these will then form homologous pairs which we looked at in uh, meiosis then haploid means n or is represented by n and it means that there's only one copy of each chromosome so in humans when we talk about diploid chromosomes uh, we talk about 46 chromosomes or 23 pairs and if they are haploid it means that it is the half, half of 46 which is 23 chromosomes and they are not in pairs otherwise they would be diploid. Looking at the diagram on the left, so this is uh, the human life cycle uh, represented in a very short diagram. So pink uh, represents diploid and blue represents haploid. Now in the female ovaries, uh, she will produce uh, one egg cell which contains 46 chromosomes and in the male testes, you will produce sperm cells that also contain 46 chromosomes. Now if these two were to fuse, if the female egg cell was to fuse with the male sperm cell, um, in this, it would not produce 46 uh, chromosomes, it would produce 92, which would make it not human. So they need to undergo meiosis in order to be halved so that the female egg cell contains 23 chromosomes and the male sperm cell then also contains 23 chromosomes so that when these two fuse, they can produce 46, which makes it human. Now, just a quick guide here, gametes is the, the female egg cell or the ovum and also then the male sperm cell. They are referred to as gametes or sex cells. Just for future reference, sometimes I do um, interchange between the word ovum and egg cell just so you, that you are aware that I don't confuse you um, later in the videos. So when these two have now undergone meiosis, they can now finally fuse through the process of fertilization and that will then produce a diploid zygote. So a zygote that contains 46 chromosomes, that's what that diploid means. This zygote will then undergo mitosis and development, so it will grow and develop and it will form a blastocyst that will then finally be implanted into the female uterus and from there it will grow and develop and she will give birth to a very beautiful baby that can be either male or female and then that baby will grow and mature until it hits puberty and then it will go through this process itself as well. Looking at the male reproductive system, you need to be able to label this diagram. Don't worry, you don't need to draw it. It is quite a complex thing to draw. So you just need to be able to label this. And what sections do you need to be able to label? You need to be able to label the testes, the epididymis, the vas deferens, the seminal vesicle, the prostate gland, the cowper's gland, and the urethra. And then obviously, um, as it says in the exam guidelines, you also need to know the functions of these different parts. So let's see where they sit. Um, I've given you quite a few different diagrams here just because they can either give you a side view as this one represents or this one or they can give you a frontal view which is this diagram below. Now let's see, let's start with the testes. So testes is plural and if there's a, a I like here in the, at the top, if there's an I over there, it means it's singular, but it's, it's not a big train smash if you um, accidentally write testes instead of testis. It sits right over there and it sits on the outside of the body inside the scrotum. And the reason it sits on the outside is because the sperm cells are very temperature sensitive and they need to be at a certain temperature for 
um, them to be produced optimally. And the reason they sit on the outside is because outside is around about two degrees Celsius cooler than on the inside of the body. And then the scrotum also protects, uh, protects the testes. So the functions of the testes is to produce testosterone, so the meme, uh, male hormone, sexual hormone, and then it produces and releases sperm cells, um, obviously. Next is the epididymis. So in this frontal view, the epididymis sits just above the testes. On the right hand side sits over there, and then on the left sits over here. Kind of looks like a really bad mullet. So the epididymis, what does it do? It stores the sperm cells until they mature, so it's like a little preparatory school for sperm. And then it also secretes a mucus that will help with the sperm's motility, so for them to be able to move. Next is the vas deferens, which is this long tube that extends all the way around. So the, these two tubes you see over here, that is the ureter. So coming from the kidneys and goes into the bladder. This is the bladder over here, just so we know what sits where. So the vas deferens loops around that and it comes about and it, we'll talk about where it goes after that. So on this side, this is the vas deferens going around and on this one also over here. There's the bladder on the right hand side and on the left, this is the bladder over there. So what does the vas deferens do? It's very simple. It just transports the sperm and it does that with, peri with peristaltic movements. It is also known as the sperm duct, the vas deferens, but preferably use that one. Next is the seminal vesicle. So on the left hand diagram, it's this little thing that sits over there. And over here, it's represented as a bit bigger but it's that area, and on the right hand side, it's that structure over there. Now, this is actually part of the accessory glands, and they will secrete quite a lot of fluids um, that will eventually make up semen. So, semen equals sperm plus the fluids of these accessory glands. So, sperm are produced in there, and then all of these fluids will be added on, and then you'll finally get semen, which will be ejaculated during copulation. So the semical, seminal vesicle, what does it do? It actually secretes a yellowish a sticky substance and this substance contains fructose, so a type of sugar. And the main source of that is to provide nutrition for the sperm. Yes, they also need food apparently. And then next one we'll be looking at is the prostate gland. So on the left hand side, the prostate gland is this gland that sits right underneath the bladder. Uh, on the right hand side in the middle here, the prostate gland there. And way on the right hand side, it's that dark purple thing that you can see. Now, what does the prostate gland do? It also secretes a substance. And in this case, it's an alkaline substance because of the low pH conditions that are found in the urethra and then in the vagina. So the urethra is used for both urine and um, semen transport. So obviously it needs to be cleared of urine before the semen pass through there, otherwise the low pH conditions can, can kill a lot of the sperm. So it protects the sperm against the low pH of the urethra and the vagina, just to say that again. And it will also help with the sperm motility for them to be able to move and swim around in. Then the last gland that we'll look at is the cowper's gland. Now pay attention because it's really tiny here on the left. It's that little thing that sits right below the prostate gland. And on the right hand side, you can see them a little clearer. Um, one on either side, there they are. Now on this diagram, it's known as the bulbourethral gland, but you please need to know it as the cowper's gland. On the right hand side, it's not really clearly indicated on this diagram, but it should sit around there if I can draw it in myself. And the cowper's gland also secretes a fluid and this helps the sperm with motility. It will also clear the urethra of urine before the sperm moves through there and it also will lubricate the head of the penis for copulation. Then lastly, the urethra, the long tube, 
um, which we've already spoken about. So the urethra transports both urine and sperm. And this here is a cross section of the testis. Um, here, what you uh, can look out for is the seminiferous tubules, which uh, is actually where the sperm production happens. So this on the right hand side is a cross section of the seminiferous tubule uh, where sperm are produced. But we'll look at that when we look at spermatogenesis, so the production of sperm. So once the sperm are produced, they move out and they enter into the epididymis, which is also has quite a few long tubes where they grow and mature. And from there, once they are ready to be ejaculated, they go up through the vas deferens with peristaltic movements. Okay, moving on to the female reproductive system. Once again, you need to be able to label uh, this system. And what do you need to know here? Uh, you need to know where the ovary sits, the fallopian tubes, the uterus that is lined with the endometrium, the cervix, the vagina, and the external opening of the vagina, which is the vulva. And then you also have to know the, the internal structure of the ovary specifically, the primary follicles, the graphene follicle, and then the corpus luteum. So looking at the ovary, there's an ovary on each side of the uterus, and the main function of the ovary is to produce an egg cell or an ovum, and or plural ova, because there's plenty of them, and it was also to produce progesterone and estrogen, which is the female hormones. Now, hovering above the ovary is the fallopian tube, so this long tube over here. And it has these finger-like projections that hover over the ovary that will then catch the egg cell as soon as it is released during ovulation and it will travel up there. So what are the functions of the fallopian tube? It is firstly to transport the egg cell or the, the ovum and then um, also when fertilization has occurred, the zygote. So fertilization occurs within the fallopian tube, then the zygote will travel down into the uterus and that is done with peristaltic movements of the fallopian tube and then it also has cilia that perform sweeping movements to help get the egg cell or let's rather say the zygote along if fertilization has occurred. Then the uterus, next section um, of the female reproductive system. So what does the uterus do? It is responsible for the care of the embryo uh, or after eight weeks it is known as the fetus. So this is where growth and development of the fetus will occur. Next is the cervix, this area over here. And the cervix allows, allows for menstrual uh, blood flow from, from the uterus out into the vagina to the external, um, well, to the outside. And then it also dilates for the passage of the baby during birth. So this will st um, stretch out and dilate. Then next is the vagina. This whole area here is the vagina. And during intercourse, the penis will release the sperm directly into the vagina and they'll make their way up through uh, the uterus and then they can decide which fallopian tube they want to go to. And then the vulva, which will sit out here on the right hand side. So the vulva is just the external opening of the vagina. Now once again, this is the frontal view and I've given you a side view as well just so you can see where everything fits together. So this here is the bladder and then above it is the uterus. So the structure here is the uterus and then attached to that the fallopian tube and then the ovary that will sit over there or the ovaries plural, these two. Um, so this is the cervix, then you've got the vagina and then the external opening which is the vulva. And this is why pregnant women have to use the restroom so often is because the uterus sits right above the bladder. So just imagine if there is a fetus growing and developing in there, it's going to press against the bladder and it's going to lessen the volume of urine that can be kept in there. But look how everything fits in perfectly. The human body is amazing. 
So this is a cross section through the ovary. Um, you need to know the primary follicle, the graphene follicle, and the corpus luteum in the ovary. We'll look at um, oogenesis, which is the production of, of the egg cell. Then we'll look at this diagram again. But just so you know, this is the primary follicle. That's what it looks like. Then you've got the graphene follicle, uh, which is basically just the primary follicle growing and developing as fluid builds up and as it becomes bigger. Then on the inside, you've got the egg cell there. And then this will grow and become bigger until it presses up against the ovary walls and it will rupture during the process of ovulation, releasing that egg cell. And then what is left of the graphene follicle will then become a structure known as the corpus luteum. Please do not confuse the corpus luteum with the corpus callosum in the brain. Um, I know it's very easy to do that. So the corpus luteum, one of my previous students referred to it as, the, as a pineapple ring. And it kind of looks like a really wrinkled pineapple ring. Uh, so this is also responsible for hormones that will be released during pregnancy to maintain uh, the endometrium.